Roald Dahl's masterpiece Matilda was published in 1988, which I thought was a really long time ago, but turns out was only two years before my birth. Good. Eight years later, in the year 1996, when I was but a mere pimple in the eye of my reception teacher, a cinematic legend was born when Mara Wilson played Matilda in the very, very famous film adaptation. It is now the year 2022, and someone has had the audacity, the gall, the nerve, the gumption to release a new adaptation of Matilda. Un touchable or is it in this video we're going to find out now of course i realize pitting these two films together one of them being a screen adaptation a commercial film that takes many liberties and an interpretation of the book in musical form based on the stage production it's not a completely fair comparison it's not a completely fair parallel but guess what i'm here to have freaking fun my heroes are dead my enemies are in power a little distraction never hurt anyone so i'm here to conclude definitively who would win, ding ding, 1996 or 2022. Two things to note before we begin. I am of course aware that Matilda 2022 is based on the stage play. It was actually developed down the road from me in the Midlands and was shown there before it went to the West End and subsequently Broadway. I've seen it, I like it, I'm gonna go and see it again next week. But as the audience for the 2022 film will have not probably had a chance to see the stage show and they are presenting the 2022 film as a finished standalone piece, I am going to judge it on that alone. Although obviously some of the questions I have for the 2022 film, I also have for the stage play, but you get the idea. And the second thing is, this is my subjective opinion. My opinions belong in this video, your opinions belong in the comments. And I'd be very, very curious if you have watched this adaptation or even if you haven't to hear which one for you reigns victorious. As with my Emma comparison video where I gave engagement rings instead of scores, in this video, I am going to be awarding newts. And if you don't know why, maybe you haven't watched either of these adaptations and you go do that before you watch this video. <laughs> I will be scoring the films in four categories, world building, casting, important scenes, and Matilda herself. So let's go. World building. Now the biggest thing to note about the 22 version is that Matilda returns to her original setting. It is set, as the book is set, in Britain. And you can really tell, it's, it's gritty, grey landscape, grobby buildings, always reigning Britain. Unlike the Welsh California that was invented for sex education that was either chosen, I guess, by somebody who had never visited Britain or perhaps more likely an optimist. The 1996 version by comparison makes use of a lot of primary colors and exaggerates decor. Decor? Decor. Decor. Anyway, while the cinematic universe of the 1996 film definitely has a distinct warm style. I would say the 2022 version has much more of a feel of Quentin Blake's original illustrations, which are the things that Roald Dahl signed off and are what live in the public imagination when we think about Roald Dahl books. It has the surrealism of the original Willy Willy Won- Willy Willy Won it has the surrealism of the original Charlie and the Chocolate Factory film adaptation, and I love that about it. I think it's really beautiful to look at. And the review I read in The Independent said, it's intrinsically British enough that I half expected it to be soon absorbed into the Paddington cinematic universe. And I definitely agree with that. And it's also really interesting when you find out that the writer of the book, so the, the music was composed by Tim Minchin and so were the lyrics, but the book, as in the script, was written by Dennis Kelly, who wrote my favourite TV series I think ever, Utopia, which I don't didn't promote on this channel for a long time because it's about a government who put something very suspicious in a vaccine. But Dennis Kelly, who is an incredible writer, apparently refused and still to this date has not seen the 1996 version. And you can tell that. I think the universes that both of these films build are reputably sourced from the text, but do not reference each other because obviously the 1996 people hadn't seen the 2022 version because they don't have a time traveling machine. And Dennis Kelly just was like, nah, you're all right. That I think leaves a lot of room for discovery and excitement if you are somebody who has loved the 1996 version because you will be seeing something really fresh and new. A particular favorite is how far they took the Wormwoods house and the addition of making the static library into a mobile library so we have all these really beautiful surrealist scenes of different places that Miss Phelps parks the mobile library which I absolutely freaking love. As an audience member the 2022 version gets the newt in this round. <laughs>
casting. I have a lot to say about casting, but it's also worth saying that when I talk about casting in this video, I'm going to also be talking about characterization because there's lots of choices not necessarily made by the actors that make up the character and are so interwoven with it that I can't talk about them separately. The first thing to note before I actually go into some of the characters is the lack of characters. So we're missing the brother. Michael, RIP, killed off apparently before his time. I didn't really see the point of this. Michael is in both the book and the 1996 version and he offers a very good contrast of the kind of child the Wormwoods were expecting, which accentuates how disappointed they are when they get a kid like Matilda. I think they probably did it to save some time because they used the time for like something else, which I'll get into, but also probably so they could make this running joke they inserted about how Mr. Wormwood wished that Matilda was a boy and keeps calling her lad and stuff. Do you have a luxury car? I've got two boy. I'm a girl. Which was like not that funny and not that effective enough to justify like killing off a whole character. So for that we give one newt to the 1996 version for preserving the life of Michael. Perhaps the most vital casting besides Matilda herself is Miss Trunchbull. In the 1996 version, we have Pam Ferris, who I realised also plays Aunt Marge. And in the 2022 version, we have Dame, is she a dame? I think she's a dame. Lady Emma Thompson, British royalty, known for playing loads of really infamous characters, but not necessarily known for playing that many evil characters. So that's been interesting. I was a little bit worried, but my fears were completely alleviated when I saw Emma Thompson on screen, while Pam, our Pam, plays anger and desperation really, really well, and was terrifying to me as a child. Emma Thompson, I can imagine, is more terrifying to children and therefore more effective. While I also know her for crying over a CD in Love Actually, or frolicking as our Eleanor Dashwood, she brings the evil, just like she did in Cruella, and the sternness that she brought to saving Mr. Banks. And when I heard that she was playing Miss Trunchbull, I was also relieved because there is a tradition with the stage show to cast men. They have cast women once or twice, but mainly it's been men because they have a height restriction, but also apparently they just like casting men. I would love to hear probably more nuance that you could give this in the comments, but I am a little bit fearful of consistently casting men to play evil women because there's something monstrous about a man in a skirt. And I don't know if I'm reading too much into that and maybe it's like a really liberating like drag-esque role where it's good that a man plays Miss Trunchbull, but cinematically I think it's much better that it's played by a woman and also that this woman wasn't wearing a fat suit, which I was really, really relieved about. Pam is a larger woman and I think they did, I think I read that they did bulk her up for the 1996 version and give her a bit of a fat suit, but she isn't written that way. And I was worried they would want to mimic the visuals of the 1996 version without actually casting somebody larger. Instead, what they've done is give her the physique that Roald Dahl describes, which is the physique of a tall woman who has also competed in the Olympics. She's described in the book as a gigantic holy terror. She had once been a famous athlete and even now the muscles were still clearly in evidence. You could see them in the bulk of her neck, the big shoulders, in the thick arms, the sinewy wrists and the powerful legs. They did do some prosthetics on her face to make her look older and more angular, but they didn't like try and make her look heavier. And they also gave her Spice Girl boots, which I thought was a move. And I quite enjoyed it actually. So while Pam Ferris might be what my mind conjures when I think of Miss Trunchbull, probably forever, rationally looking at Emma Thompson and her portrayal, I think she gave the character of Miss Trunchbull much more depth and she felt a lot more unpredictable. With Pam, it was kind of like on or off, on or off, livid or evil and docile, whereas Emma was much more of a dial of evil and I genuinely thought she smashed it. So a newt for you, Emma, a newt for you. The next character is Miss Honey. Embeth Davis played her in the 1996 version and Lashana Lynch, played her in the 2022 version. By casting Lashana, the directors were decodifying the idea of Miss Honey as white and simultaneously the idea that pure equals white because she is described as pure, I think porcelain, but pure doesn't equal white and innocent doesn't equal blonde. Soft doesn't equal petite and those are things that aren't in the text they've just been extrapolated by the text and depicted as like a small petite blonde white lady. Embit Davis is 
fine. She's good. She's lovely as Miss Honey, but again, a little bit more two dimensional. And you can also see, even in the way she's betraying Miss Honey, that she could like turn on a dime and be a bit different. Like, let's not forget, she is also Natasha in Bridget Jones' diary. Watching both versions as an adult, I didn't completely forget that Embeth was acting, whereas Lashana, I, she, she disappeared into the role. I completely forgot that she was acting all together. And she also, in this film, has a solo called My House, which made me cry. And she was so good. It was one of the takeaway best songs in the whole film. There were definitely a lot of weaker songs, but her song really stood out. And Lashana herself has said that she thinks it's going to be inspiring for people to see a young black woman on screen, not being perfect, not striving for excellent, and not having to adhere to any rules that have been placed around her. She just is. Smashed it. It is a newt for the 2022 version. I haven't really got much to say about Miss Phelps, um, because I don't really think this one is a very fair fight at all. Miss um, Phelps is the librarian that helps Matilda at the beginning of the book, but she's given a much bigger part in the 2022 version. In the 1996 version, she's played by Jean Spiegel Howard, and she's good. We like her, but in the 2022 version, she's played by Sindhu V, who is an Indian comedian and hilarious. You should watch some of her stand up, she's really funny. Sindhu played this part with utter sincerity, but also like an undercurrent of hilarity. Um, and she made like quite an unmemorable part, really, really memorable. I felt like she was really warm. She had her own story. I would like a spin-off film just about Miss Phelps from the glimpses that I saw of her character in this film. Just as I would probably like a redemption arc Miss Trunchbull film, like Wicked-esque, like what's what's behind Miss Trunchbull. But this is an immediate newt for the 2022 version. I think what they did with Miss Phelps and who they cast was bloody brilliant. The Wormwoods get much less screen time in the 2022 version, which I think the story is the poorer for, which I'll get into later in the video. But again, this probably isn't a very fair fight because Danny DeVito, plays Mr. Wormwood and he's utterly fantastic. The new Wormwoods didn't really stand a chance and I don't think that the screen time they had, they really stood out. They just kind of like delivered. So that is a win for the 1996 version, hands down. But I'm not gonna score the ensemble, but I just wanna give a slight little shout out because the ensemble in the 2022 version were incredible, but like they're not really comparable in anything they do or their tasks. So I'm not gonna score them. Next we have important scenes. Uh, there are three scenes in the book that I think are really integral to making a successful Matilda adaptation. One of them is the Bruce eating the cake scene. That's really incredible. It has to be grotesque and it has to demonstrate how really cruel uh, Miss Trunchbull is and how it affects the dynamic of the school children as a group. The 2022 version turns this scene into a disco scene, which was incredible to watch. Very, very stagey. Disco balls, sequins everywhere. It was a good time, but it lacked this still chilling sincerity of the original 1996 version. And it, it be, because it didn't deliver on the emotions, I'm going to give it to the 1996 version, even though I did enjoy a good song and a dance. I just don't really think that that was the time for karaoke. The second scene that they needed to get right was the chokey. Uh, I had that written down before I went into the cinema to watch the Matilda version. And uh, I have to say in the 2022 version, they don't go into the freaking chokey. Nobody does. You don't see inside the chokey. Matilda doesn't go in the chokey. It's a, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. You see it from the outside, but there's no, it's not chilling because you don't get the claustrophobia of actually being in it. I don't know if that was like to make sure it passed the modern day standards for being PG, but there's so much other violence in the film that that can't have been the reason, but I, I can't for the life of me work out why nobody actually goes into the chokey. So obviously this is a 1996 newt. Hands down, why? The third is the end scene. Because I'm going to unpack this at the end of the video with the Matilda analysis, I'm not going to go into it properly here, but I am also just going to give 996 a point for that as a spoiler for later in the video, because you'll see why, but I think the final scene is incredibly vital to get right. And I think that they might have got it quite wrong. The other thing I wanted to score points for in this category is additional scenes. Both are film adaptations from a book. They're allowed to add new scenes. They're allowed to do new things. And they both had some additional scenes that I'd like to comment on. In the 2022 version, um, they have this whole circus palaver, which was written for the stage originally. So it makes more sense to give more visual arcs for the audience when you're stuck in an auditorium and you can't go to a school or you can't go to the Wormwood's house and you just have to like make do with very minimal set. 
to have a circus element to the story make sense on stage in the film it is beautiful to look at and it is a nice standalone story and bit of cinematography in itself but because of time constraints because a film has to be a lot shorter than a stage show and you don't get an interval it took so much screen time away from a lot of the quite vital world building that i think you really need to get matilda on a first watch if you've never watched or seen it before that bit while really cool did feel like it was there for the fans of the stage show and not like serving the actual audience that are watching the trunchbull revenge scene um doesn't happen in the trunchbull's house which i think is kind of vital to our understanding of like her being the antithesis of a domestic warm motherly figure who's literally taken over the house of, of the patriarch. Being trapped in the Trunchbull's own house and like running from her into different rooms is a terrifying prospect. What we have instead is a detention scene where there are chokies but again nobody goes in them and there is like a CGI monster made out of the chains that she uses for the chokey which is like really out of place and a bit cheesy and americanized and I, I feel like making monsters out of cgi'd inanimate objects is like what you do if you can't create terror in a more subtle clever way for children and you're like what are children scared of monsters so that is like literally the worst thing about the film i hate uh, that's the bit i hated in the 2022 version there are some additional scenes the establishing motor car scene where they actually go and see what mr wormwood does to deceive people at the end of the amanda thrip throwing by the pigtails she falls through a field of flowers which is both magical and also like makes a really good point about how the trunch ball gives punishments but they she's so not really powerful that all of her punishments don't have as much of a evil ending as she'd like. And there's also the incredible pancake scene, which wouldn't fit in the 2022 version because kids in Britain don't eat pancakes for breakfast. And it just feels a bit, it just feels very US-esque. Uh, but it's also the, one of the most magical cinematic scenes of all film history. And it establishes Matilda finding the joy of being an estranged child and like the independence of of intelligence. It has so many layers and I can really see why it's there. I don't resent it being there. So for that, additional scenes, 1996 gets it. And the final category, Matilda, casting and characterization. Who wins? Now, it's, it's tough because we've got Mara Wilson, child acting prodigy, versus Alicia Weir, who is relatively new to starring and stuff. I think she's done a few small parts in TV shows, but she's never done anything big. She's an Irish actor. And most notably, she's 30. Now, quite vitally in the books, I think, Matilda is five and a half. It's reiterated the whole way through the book. And one of the magic things about Matilda is that she's five and a half and she's read a whole roster of classics and she talks like an adult. That's part of the magic of her. Now, when Mara Wilson was playing Matilda, she was like seven to eight, whereas Alicia was 13. And when you're that age, there's a huge difference visually, emotionally, verbally. Anyone who's ever met a child can, can tell you that. There's a big difference between a 12 year old and a seven year old. And it, it on Honestly, it just, I couldn't let it, it just wouldn't stop bothering me. And I understand that in the stage show, they probably have to cast older actors for legal reasons, maybe, and also just agility reasons. You need a really strong voice to perform every single night and do all the dance moves every single time. But the film format doesn't have those constraints. So why did you cast somebody so old? And of course, you know, it casting a prodigy to play a prodigy is probably annoying and it probably takes a really long time to find somebody that good but it has been done before after Mara Wilson and I don't think that prodigies have just stopped being born. This isn't to say that Alicia did a bad job, I think she did a really good job for a 12 year old but since Matilda we had Georgie Healy in Lime the Witch Wardrobe, she was only eight when she did that. We had Jaden Smith in The Pursuit of Happiness, he was eight when he did that. Macaulay Culkin was nine when he filmed Home Alone and Abigail Breslin was only five when she was inside. She would have been a great Matilda at five. Like, she would have been so good. Also, Alicia was playing an accent that wasn't hers and she did it really well. I had no idea that she wasn't English. But the whole way through the film, I was thinking, why is she so posh? That age back. But isn't that illegal? And sort of wrong? If you are helping a child learn a new accent, you could help them learn a less posh British accent. Because again, the whole point of Matilda is that she isn't 
from a posh area or from a posh background. They also made this school look a bit posh, but I don't have time to go into that, but why the hats? <laughs> it's expressed that they're at a state primary school in the book explicitly. So why did you have to make her posh? Also part of the thing, which, you know, like it or don't like it, is that like the Wormwoods are supposed to be the lower striving middle classes or the working classes that are tricking their way into being middle to upper class. I don't know if that should be something that's like, funny, but it is the point of the Wormwoods and the point of Matilda's socioeconomic background, that she isn't from a background where she would have been exposed to the classics any other way than exposing herself. Maybe I'm just thinking too much about it, maybe I'm codifying class in a way that doesn't need to be codified, but it was really distracting as an adult viewer. I'm sure that kids wouldn't give a fuck. We also don't find that she has these telekinetic powers until really far into the film. The film does feel quite long as well. Uh, I was actually in the cinema with a child similar to Matilda's age and she was also kind of losing it for the length. She had to be taken out for a bit, even though she was like enjoying it. She came back, she sung the songs at the end. But the, the children that I was seeing in the, sh in the screening that I was in were really struggling to sit through it as it was. But we don't actually found out that Matilda has these special powers until quite late in the film, which was weird until I then went home and reread the book and remembered that that actually happens quite late in the book too, which made me think even more favourably of the 1996 version because they introduced that part of Matilda's character so much earlier and it makes it so much more magic and pacey and it gives you so much more to play with when you realise that she has these powers. But the most important thing about Matilda's characterisation, not Alicia's choices obviously, but the film's choices, is that in the 2022 version, Matilda does not save herself. In the book, it's Matilda's idea to be adopted. She asks Miss Honey, Miss Honey says, oh, I'd never ask that unless you asked it first. Like, emphasizes the consent there. She wants to be adopted by Miss Honey and that's even further emphasized in the 1996 version where she actually keeps adoption papers in her bag that she's printed out for years and just carries around with her in case anyone else wants to adopt her apart from her parents who are not her parents, <laughs> which is an hilarious like exaggeration of what's in the book, but like really faithful to the spirit of Matilda and like, I love it. So the fact that the crescendo of the film is that Matilda saves the whole school and is the bravest, most outspoken child child out there and then just timidly walks to the car to go away away with the wormwoods and like doesn't try and fight for her own future is like out of character not textually correct and like pretty sad. The addition also that I was talking about before, the circus elements, I don't have time to explain the whole thing, but basically she's had these stories come into her head telepathically uh, that she didn't put there about the story of a life, the tragic life that yeah, it's about the circus and stuff. And it turns out to be Miss Honey's backstory. And she realizes that she has this weird connection to Miss Honey and it's like all destined to be. Now inserting predestination into the relationship between Miss Honey and Matilda is like a weird choice because I think what's beautiful about their parent-child dual liberation narrative is that they both choose it. They are chosen family. That's nice. That's the thing. Why did you have to do anything else? Do I need to say that the 996 version gets a new? The 996 version gets a new. Overall, I had a really good night out seeing the 2022 version. I had a great time. I felt like I was entertained, like I was warmed, like I got some nice things to look at, had a little bit of a laugh. I wouldn't kick that film out of bed. However, even though the 1996 version is based on a completely different continent to the original, book. It really felt closer to the tone of Roald Dahl books. It has a closeness, a quaintness, and it also has a narrator, which gives it some tonal consistency between the book and the film and makes it feel much more like this kind of proscenium arch, picture book-esque fable of a girl's life. The 2022 version had like a slight Umbrella Academy vibe. They give Matilda a superhero feel, which isn't as subtle as I felt like it needed. And I also don't know if children need to be like hit over the head with stuff. I think they, they can be trusted to pick up on the more subtle magic things in life. They don't need like a chain monster to be scared. They can be scared by an atmosphere or a hint or the mere presence of a very trained good actress. The 2022 adaptation is a great translation of the stage show into a film. And I think it's way more effective on the stage. In fact, I kind of wonder if there was a point to making this, or could you not have just like filmed the stage version? As a child, I absolutely loved watching stage 
filmed performances of shows I couldn't go and see myself. And with the commercial success of Hamilton, I think everyone would have had a better time and saved more money just filming the stage version because the stage version is brilliant. So while it is a good film, I think that the 1996 version is much more fit for purpose. It uses all the aspects for film to tell the story in a new way. It changes things, but for obvious reasons that are pretty effective and tr stay true to the spirit of the book. It makes some changes to pace and gives it additions, but they are overall additions that I think maybe if Roald Dahl had been consulted from Below the Grave, he would have been like, yeah, go for it. For example, the really infamous line with the Danny DeVito says, I'm smart, you're dumb. I'm big, you're little. I'm right, you're wrong and there's nothing you can do about it. That's not in the book, but isn't it a perfect Roald Dahlian phrase that like completely solidifies who Mr. Wormwood is in his essence? I try not to cling to my nostalgia and I always love seeing new versions of books that I love, but sometimes like in the instance of this, it makes me appreciate how good the one that I love actually is and seeing two disparate, different imaginings of a world that is quite literally living on the page and doesn't have the colour and the life that your imagination can give it is cool and I, I'm, I'm not mad about it but that's my opinion. I think that the 1996 version is a clear front run winner for those reasons but what do you think? It doesn't matter what I think, who am I? A woman in a velvet dress talking to herself in the middle of the day, that's who I am. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to watch more film comparisons I have a playlist over here just for you or maybe you fancy something different we've got a little menu over here maybe you would like one of these. This video has been made possible by the Gumption Club who tip me per video to make sure these videos keep happening and in exchange I let them into a secret Facebook group and I give them a podcast of my stream of consciousness thoughts every single week. You can hear more about that below. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a video. Frog Snog out.